Well, good morning, C3. How you guys doing this morning? Good, good. It's good to see you. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Anybody excited about Super Bowl tonight? Nice. You guys excited? Sweet. Uh, I think we can all agree on one thing. We're all rooting for a team that wears red, right? We can all say that, right? And we can just stop there and we can all have the same mind, you know? We can all be unified in that. Uh, A question for you. Um, Have you ever... Uh, turned off a game too early. You turned off a game in the third quarter and you're thinking, there's no way my team can come back from this deficit. There's, there's no way they can, they can overcome this, this lead. And then the next morning, like you go to bed, you know, you forget about it. The next morning you, you turn on the morning news or you turn on Sports Center in the morning and you're like, I missed the greatest comeback my team has had in the last 50 years. What, did I, what was I thinking, you know? Anybody ever done that? You ever done that? Turned off a game too early? Um, uh, I, I, because of Super Bowl Sunday, I thought it would be fun for us to look back on, on the three greatest Super Bowl comebacks of all time, okay? And you might be familiar, they're, they're all in recent history, um, and you might be familiar with a, with a few of them. The first one, I think we've got a picture right here. This one, you might be familiar with this one. Um, as, a, as a Broncos fan, I'm hoping this isn't a repeat of what happens tonight personally, but you guys know what happened, right? They're all celebrating. There's, there's 12 minutes left in the game, and you guys know what, what happened. The Chiefs scored 21 straight points and, and won uh, their first Super Bowl uh, under uh, Patrick Mahomes there. Okay, that was just a few years ago, right? You might know that's the third greatest. The, the second greatest uh, is this one right here. Uh, you can see the Seahawks are beating the Patriots uh, by 10 points or with eight minutes left. And you might know, and it's Tom Brady on the other side, and he uh, uh, leads them back. They're up 28 to 24. The Patriots are up. But then the Seahawks have a chance to come back and, and win the game at the end. They have first and goal at the two-yard line. And they have, you might, know, not, you might know nothing about football, but let me just tell you, their running back's nickname was Beast Mode. That was his nickname. And they're at the two, they got to get two yards to win the Super Bowl. And instead of handing it off to the guy whose nickname Beast Mode they decide to throw the ball, and that's, that's where we ended with this meme template of Richard Sherman looking at the sideline like, what were we thinking? That's, that's what happened. But the greatest comeback in recent history, in Super Bowl history, is this one. You might remember this box score where the Patriots were down 28-3 to with just over two minutes left in the third quarter. They came all the way back, tied it, went to overtime, and, and won the game, 34-28. to Pretty crazy. Um, now, so my, my hope, my encouragement to you tonight is don't tune out too early of the game. Anything can happen, as you've seen. Anything can happen in, the, in that last quarter. And here's how this connects. The book of Jonah probably has one of the most overlooked final chapters of any book in, in the Bible. Uh, we, get, we get to quarter three in, in Jonah, and it seems like, okay, we get it, right? God saved the people. We get it. We can, we can walk away. But a lot of times this is overlooked. And to prove my point, I brought the Jesus Storybook Bible with me up here on, on stage. You might have one of these if you've come through even baby dedication in, in this church, and you, you have a few of these that are dedicated uh, to your kiddo uh, that came through. I, we love this at my house. We Go through this, uh, I mean, not all the time, but, pre- but every once in a while we pull out this book and we'll read through stories. It's a great starting point for your kiddos. This is their account of the story of Jonah. I'm going to pick up halfway through. This is what he, it says, after three days, the fish spat Jonah safely out onto the sandy beach. There you go, right there. You can see it right there. <laughs> Just then, Jonah heard someone calling his name. Go to Nineveh, God said. And this time, Jonah said, yes. He went straight to Nineveh and told everyone God's wonderful message. What was that message? Even though you've run far from God, he can't stop loving you, Jonah told them. Run to him so he can forgive you. The people of of Nineveh listened to Jonah and they started loving God. They learned to do what God said and to stop running away from him just like Jonah. The end. Now what's missing here? Chapter 4 is missing. There's nothing about chapter 4. This, is, this ends with uh, the people of Nineveh turning and repenting. And now, listen, these, these, uh, this, these are great books. I'm not, don't, don't hear me say this is worthless and you should never read this because this is awesome. And I, we read it almost, all, almost every week uh, with our kids. So this is very valuable and the lessons in here are very valuable. But I think sometimes we overlook the final chapter of Jonah and we miss the main point of what Jonah's trying to communicate. In, in this little four-chapter narrative, we can miss it if we tune out too early in the fourth quarter. See, I think it actually even changes the lesson 
of the, of the narrative a little bit. Like maybe if we only see Jonah chapters one through three, we can, we can see just, oh, this is a story about the difference between Jonah's disobedience and his, in his, his obedience, right? And that's, a, that's definitely a theme in this, in this uh, little narrative that we've been reading. It might be, man, man, God gives us second chances, and that's a big theme through Jonah. It might even be, hey, don't run from God. Instead, run to him, as the, as the Jesus Storybook Bible says there. And that is an important lesson for us, to, for us to grasp and for us to realize. But I, I think it's missing the point of what this story is really all about. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read through Jonah chapter 4 in one big chunk here. And I just want to make two observations this morning. One about Jonah, one about God, and then maybe we can see what he's trying to teach us throughout our whole study in in the book of Jonah. Okay, so let's read, starting in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. This is what it says. This is right after God saw what the Ninevites did, that he relented, he turned, they turned from their evil way, and he relented from disaster, and he did not he not, did not do what he said he was going to do. He he pardoned them. And this is what it says. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in, a sh- in the shade till, till he should see what would become of the city. Now, the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Uh, Question, by show of hands, how many of you have never heard that part of the story? How many of you guys never really heard that part of the story, okay? Right, I think there's some of us that have never heard this part of the story, and I think there's a lot that we could talk about in Jonah chapter four. As we've seen in our study, there's a lot that we could talk about, there's a lot to to unpack here, but I really wanna just summarize it in, in two main points. The first point is the point about Jonah. It's just simply this, Jonah is angry. Right? Jonah's angry. That's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, there's nothing really uh, right home about, about that point. You know, Jonah is angry. That's pretty obvious. Jonah's angry. The, the word anger is used six times here in the final chapter of Jonah, and you can see just how angry he is. It actually literally translated, he became hot with anger. That's, this is the kind of anger that he had. And he, ha- he kind of like just lets God hear it a little bit. Just kind of has a screaming match at God. And then like, it's one of those things, even when, when God is saying, do you do well to be angry? Jonah's already ignoring him and walking away the other way. He's like so angry, just going off on, on God and then just saying, I don't even want to hear what you have to say, God. I'm, I'm done with this. The question that I think we have, we have to ask though is why? Why do you think Jonah's so angry here in, in Jonah chapter four. Uh, at first glance, it doesn't make sense, right? This is what Jonah was called to do. He's called to go and to speak, right? This is the evangelism that he was, he was called to do. Uh, this, this is, and, and what happens is a favorable outcome. He went and he spoke and the people, it was miraculous, the people repented of their evil. They turned to God. This is, this is crazy. This is exactly what, what you would think. Why is Jonah angry here? It, it would be like if Taylor Swift got mad because she received a standing ovation at the end of her concert. That would make no sense, right? It would, make, it would be like if the Super Bowl champs 
come back into their, their hometown for the parade and there's fans lining the streets and, and standing and shouting as loud as they can and all the players are just frustrated that all the people are there and shouting their praises. That would, this, this is what's happening here. This doesn't make sense. Now, Eugene Peterson points out that, that we get a lot of experience uh, quarreling with God because God doesn't act the way that we think he should act. That oftentimes God doesn't act the way that we think he should act. And maybe this is why Jonah is so angry. God has not acted in the way that he assumed that he would. Maybe he's mad because God forgave these people and he, and he didn't want them to forgive him. Didn't want, didn't want God to forgive these, these people of Nineveh. Maybe Jonah uh, is mad because he's supposed to be the prophet of God and then his prediction hasn't come true. He said 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed and, and it's not destroyed after 40 days. Maybe that's why he's, he's so mad. Maybe he's just embarrassed because God, you didn't, you didn't do what I said was going to happen. I'm, I'm supposed to be the one speaking on behalf of you and now I'm just embarrassed. But, but there's something different about Jonah's anger here. His anger in Jonah chapter four is, is so fierce that I think it points to something deeper in Jonah's heart. There's a deeper truth that is, that is still rooted in Jonah's heart. I mean, you remember we talked about in Jonah chapter two, he's in the belly of a great fish and it's like he's at the end of his rope. It would make sense that in the belly of a great fish after he's gone down and down and down into the depth of his disobedience, that that would be the end of his rope. But we, we learn here when we have the full scope of the story that that was hardly the end of his rope. He's, he finds himself here in, in the belly of the great fish. He says, he cries out to God and he says, Lord, save me. That's what he says. In chapter four, he says twice, Lord, just take my life. It's better for me to die than to live. This, he's, he's, his anger and his frustration has led him to a, a deeper despair than anything he's experienced up to this point. This is crazy. He's been in the belly of a great fish and this is where where he has his deepest despair. This is, this is crazy. And here's, here's the reason. I think Jonah is angry because Jonah's top priority was not God. Jonah's top priority was something other than God. Like he had a greater concern other than honoring the Lord, other than doing his work. I mean, you remember we talked, we, we pointed out in, in Jonah chapter two, verse eight, that there's, there's one verse in that whole prayer that he doesn't personalize. You remember it? He says, those who forsake or those who uh, pay regard to vain idols, they forsake their hope and steadfast love. I'm not like that though, God. I will say salvations from, from the Lord. I will, make a sac- I will make vows to you and I will, I will do this. But he didn't realize, hey, there's still, remember we talked about the high places, the, the high places are still present in his own heart. Like there, there's still things that he hasn't fully given, given over. And we talked about repenting this last, this last 10%. He had something else that was of greater concern. And what was his idol? I think in chapter four, we see that his idol was the nation of Israel. Jonah was more concerned with the nation of Israel than he was for those who were outside of the grace of God. This is, this is a, a pretty stark thing, right? I mean, think about it though. He says, he's saying, God, how, how could you show grace and mercy to my greatest enemies? That's a relatable question, right? How, how could you show grace to the people that, that have done me so much harm? How, how could you show grace and mercy to the greatest threat of the people that you have chosen for yourself? How, how, could you, how could you show mercy to them? How could you forgive people who have done such evil, especially those people who have done evil to your people, the people you have chosen? How could you, how could you do this, God? And listen, Jonah doesn't get what he wants from God. He wanted justice to be served. He, he wanted that wicked city of Nineveh to reap the punishment of the wrath of God that they had coming to them for God to wipe out Israel's greatest enemy. And when he doesn't get what he wants from God, he looks at God and says, I have no reason to live anymore. It's better for me to die than to live. That's what he says. Do you see how backward this is? Do you see how messed up this is? He valued the nation of Israel over God in such a way that when God acted in a way that seemed to be against the best interests of the nation of Israel, Jonah says, I have no more reason to live. And he's saying it to the very person, the very being, who is our reason to live. 
you realize how backwards this is. This is the man of God, the prophet of God, saying to the, to the meaning of life himself, the very essence of life himself, saying, I don't have a reason to live. This is, this is crazy. And here's, here's the deal, though. I think, I think we, we talked about this in our first week in Jonah, that we tend to villainize Jonah and characters in the Bible. We tend to say, like, what could they be thinking? How could they possibly do that? How can Jonah, why in the world would Jonah be mad here that God did what, what he like what he did, that God forgave, that God was loving and gracious here. And I, I think it's important for us to realize, I want to point it out again, we talked about it in week one, that we relate with Bible characters far more in their weakness than we do their strength. You remember that, right? We, we, we relate with Bible characters a lot more in their weakness than we do in their strength. And here's the truth about Jonah chapter four, is Jonah in Jonah chapter four is a picture of us. We do the same kind of thing that Jonah does, often. See, we, like Jonah, we can easily, we can misplace our trust and our hope in our country or our government or our policies or our political party rather than God. We can easily do that, just like Jonah. See, we, like Jonah, we can wish evil on those who have hurt us or wronged us and mistreated us, all the while sitting in the, in the free gift of the grace and forgiveness of Jesus that we've, that we've received, not of our own merit, but because he's just freely given it to us. We can wish evil on other people while we just bask in the grace of God. And we, like Jonah, we can become upset with God whenever he doesn't do what, he, what we want him to do. When, when, he, when he doesn't give us a desired outcome, we can, we can grumble against him, we can complain against him, or we can even forsake our faith because God didn't act the way we thought he should act. We are, we are like Jonah. Jonah is a, is a picture of us in, in this chapter. And here's the truth. The, the circumstances of our lives a lot of times reveal the idols that are, that are present in our own hearts. A lot of times what's happening around us and what we put our trust in, because of what's happening around us, it reveals what we value most. It, re- it reveals what we, what we are really living for. You remember what Jonah talked about when he said, those who pay regard to vain idols, they forsake their hope in steadfast love. That's what he says in Jonah chapter two. You remember what he said, vain idols literally translated as empty nothings. This is, this is what we do whenever we value something above God and we're we're chasing after something that's ultimately empty. It's gonna leave us feeling empty. It's gonna lead us to, to nothing besides just emptiness, a void in our own hearts and lives. So the question for us today is, man, do we have eyes to see our own idols? Do we have eyes to see the own, our own things that we value above God? And do we, and where do we turn once we really realize what those idols are? Where do we turn? Uh, there's, see, Jonah is, is, he's angry because God is not his top priority. God is not his top priority. Man, may, not, may that not be the truth for us. And let's, let's let God be our top priority. And we, we submit to him, we surrender to him, we, we submit to his will in all things. But we see another thing, in this, in this text, we see, yeah, Jonah is angry, obviously. And we see another obvious point. This one's about God, though. It's that God is, the Lord is gracious. He is gracious with Jonah in Jonah chapter 4. I, mean, I, I, I think Jonah chapter 4 might give us the, uh, one, of the, one of the clearest pictures of the character of God in all of, all of Scripture. It's crazy how clear the picture of, of the character of God is in Jonah chapter four, a God who is gracious, a God who is kind, a God who is patient, a God who is compassionate. Look at all that God does, right? Jonah blows up on God, right? Remember the, the kind of blow up where you just, you know, say what you need to say and then walk away, don't even let them respond, that kind of a blow up. And you see God's simple question is, do you do well to be angry? It, it, it helps if you imagine it as like Morgan Freeman is the one saying it, you know? Like in a very calming voice, do you do well to be angry? You know, like that's, that's the tone that God has here. He's so patient and so kind towards Jonah. And I don't know about you, it's not exactly, whenever I find myself in one of those situations, there haven't been a ton of those situations, whenever somebody will just blow up on me and then walk away and not wanna hear, hear what I have to say. But when that has happened, 
you know what I don't really want to do? I don't necessarily want to be in the general vicinity of that person anytime soon <laughs> after they've just blown up on me, right? I, I don't, I don't want to like, necessarily be around them. Like That's not the first, the first inclination of my heart is to go, go after them. But that's what God does. Like you see what God does immediately, he pursues Jonah. He's, he's going after Jonah. And he's not only pursuing him, he's, he's caring for him. Since Jonah goes to the east of the city to sulk in his own feelings, right? And he, and he goes and he builds himself a little, a little booth and he's just sitting there hoping that maybe God will change his mind and the destruction will still happen on the city of, of Nineveh like he, like he predicted. And he's out there, sitting out there and the Lord, you see what he did? He appointed a plant to come up and to bring shade over Jonah's head. It says to save him from his discomfort. God isn't just pursuing Jonah, he's caring for him at the same time. Jonah is hot with anger and wishes to die, and God's like, I'm still going to care for you. You might not understand completely, but I'm still going to care for you here. And you see that when he says, it says the Lord appointed a plant to, to rise up and be shade for Jonah. That's the first of three different times it says that the Lord appointed something here in chapter 4. But really, it should point us back, it should remind us of how chapter 1 ends the Lord appointed a great fish to come and swallow Jonah. This is the sovereignty of God at work here. This is, he is understanding everything that's going on, and he says, I'm going I'm to point this plant to grow over you, and then the next morning, I'm going to point a worm to eat away at the root of that plant so it'll wither and die, and then I'm going to point a great east wind to come and beat against you, and the sun to come down and, and be scorching on you. And listen, as we all of these different ways that God appoints these different things, what he's doing, what we need to realize that God is doing is he's teaching. He's like, this is an object lesson for Jonah. I'm gonna show you, obviously this isn't connecting with you yet, Jonah, so let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I'm, what I'm really all about. And this, is, this shows just God's patience with Jonah. Like you didn't get it, God had every right to just be like, fine, you can go sulk east of the city all you want. Stay there as long as you want. Hope, hope that booth works out for you well over there on the, east, on the east of the city. He had every right to turn and walk the other way, but God pursues him and says, Jonah, you still don't, still don't get it. I, I, got, I gotta show this to you. And here's the truth is even when Jonah is, is angry, hot with anger towards God, he even speaks of the, the grace of God. You see him, he says it there, and, and Jordan read it. This is a theme, this is a, 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 a thing that, that all of the nation of Israel would have known this to be true about their God. They would have practiced this. They would have said it. They would have recited it out loud in worship to their God. When he says, I knew you were a gracious and merciful God. I knew you were slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and that you relent from disaster and you forgive the sins of many. He, he knew this. He's even pointing to it with his own words, even, even though they're fueled by anger. He's, he's pointing to the truth of who God is. This, is. this is crazy. God is gracious. And this entire, entire narrative is leading us to, to this conclusion. It is totally possible. It's totally possible for us to do the work of evangelism, by definition, to go and to speak and still miss it completely. I'm going to say that again. It's totally possible for you to go forward with the good news and speak the truth of the good news and miss it completely. That's what we learned from Jonah's story. He missed it. There was something missing here. And he, I think what he's missing is he's missing the heart of evangelism. He's missing the heart of evangelism. Look, let's, let's read again in verses 9 through 11. This is what it says. God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? The, see, the word for pity here that, that is used in Jonah chapter four is the word compassion. Jonah, you have compassion for the plant. You did nothing for that plant. 
You, you feel attached to this plant because it brought you comfort, but I'm the one who, who made it and sustained it, who allowed, allowed it to grow. I'm the one who, who did all of this. Much more, I'm, I'm the one who has, who has established Nineveh, who has created all of those people in my image. I am the one who is, who is doing this. I have the right to have compassion for these people. See, Jonah was missing it, and I think we might miss it sometimes too. The heart of evangelism. Missing the heart of compassion, which is really the heart of God. We're missing it. There's, it's interesting, Jonah chapter 4 ends on a cliffhanger. You saw that again, right? It says, should I not have compassion on these people? They don't even know their right hand from their left. They're, this could be talking about little children. That was kind of a, a theme in, in the Bible. They don't know their right hand from their left. But regardless, he's, do I, should, I not have, should I not have pity on these people? Should I not have compassion for these people? It ends on a cliffhanger, and I think the, it, it leaves Jonah. We don't, like, we don't know what Jonah's response is. We don't know, we don't know what, like Jonah might still say, yeah, I'm still, I would still rather die. Maybe that's what, how he ended. Maybe that was his quick response, I don't know. But I think the reason why it ends on a cliffhanger is because Jonah is left in his booth with a dead plant next to him, pondering what's really in his heart. This is similar to a parable of Jesus in the fact that uh, C.H. Dodd said that the, the point of parables is to tease our mind into active thought. And I think that's what's happening here with Jonah. I think his mind has been teased into active thought by the words of God. Should I not have compassion on these people? Should you not have compassion on these people? And I think it's meant for us the way it's meant for, for Jonah, for us to take an inventory of our own heart. Do we have a heart for people like Jesus does? Because the truth is this, the heart of evangelism, that's what precedes the work of evangelism. Like if, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna go forward with the work of evangelism, the heart of evangelism comes first. Like we have to go. We have to go with compassion as we go and as we speak. This is something Jonah needed to realize and it's something that we need to realize as well. It's totally possible for us to go with, in the work of evangelism, go and speak and to not have the heart of evangelism with it, to not have the compassion of the Lord with it. And if we do so, then we are being poor representatives of the one who we're speaking on behalf of. Like we are terrible ambassadors if we go forward with the good news and we don't have the heart of Jesus as we go, if we don't have compassion for those who, who are lost, we can't effectively do his work without his heart. We cannot. I mean, it was Jesus' heart that led him to the marginalized. It was his heart that led him to the sick and to the rejected. It was Jesus' heart that, that led him to heal and to speak, to feed, to touch, to correct, to rebuke to live and to die. It was a heart that was, that was full of compassion and it was his heart that looked upon the crowd, saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are for you. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. It's the heart of God that is the reason why you have been commissioned for the work of evangelism. This is his heart. It's a heart that is filled with compassion. And it's a heart that we desperately need. There's an overarching question that Jonah's asking throughout this entire narrative. In these four chapters, he's, he's wrestling with this question. He can't seem to figure it out. He says, how can God be fully just and fully merciful at the same time? How can God be both of these things? This doesn't make sense in my mind. I, I believe it to be true, right? I believe the words that were written. I, I, I sang these songs in church, but I cannot make, make sense of this in my own mind. You know what's interesting? Jonah doesn't know that, the answer to that question because it's not answered in, in Jonah, chapters one through four. It's not even answered in the Old Testament. 
But there's a hint here in Jonah chapter four. See, this, this compassion that God feels for Nineveh, uh, some, some scholars have said this is like the, the love of attachment. There's the love of benevolence that I don't have to like you to do something nice to you. But this is a love of attachment that I, I feel so deeply connected to you that I have no choice than to love you. I have to love you because I'm so deeply connected. The, the, the problem here is that God doesn't need us. God didn't need Nineveh to, to feel like himself. God didn't, God didn't need to be attached to anybody. He's, he's fully whole and complete and lacking nothing in, him, in and of himself. So what's, what's interesting about this compassion that the Lord has for Nineveh and the compassion that the Lord has for us is that it is, it is completely voluntary. It is a choice that he makes for you and for me. This is the compassion that he has for those who are, who are lost. How can God be both fully just and merciful? Well, Jesus willingly chose the cross on your behalf. His compassion, his heart led him to the cross voluntarily went to the cross on your behalf. That's what he did. He lived a perfect life. He died a sinner's death and the full wrath of God, the justice of God, it was poured out on on Jesus. That's how God can be fully just. How can he be fully merciful? Because it was God himself who was taking this fully just punishment. This This is the truth of the gospel. This is, this is the way that we're brought back into his fold. Again, this is the way that we are brought back to him in a relationship, and this is a decision you can make this morning. You, we have everything you need back here. The water's a little cold, the heater's broken in the baptistry, okay, but don't let that stop you. you have, we have everything you need to come and to be baptized and to, and to join in with what God, has, God is doing. You can make Jesus the Lord and savior of your life. There's people on the back to pray with you. There's, I'll, I'll be up here to, to pray with you. If you, need, if you need prayer this morning, I want, I'm gonna ask all of us to, to stand. We're gonna stand because we're gonna respond by singing. And this song we're gonna sing is just, it's a, it's a reminder of who our God is. A God who never fails a God who is never late, a God who is always moving and working, a God who is who's filled with compassion. May we be a church that does his work with his heart. Let's sing together.